I will uh, help introduce our final panel for the day, uh, where we will hear about what is needed by conservatives and what is being done uh, by conservatives to help build trust in elections over the next year. Uh, here to moderate and introduce our panelists is R Street's Director of Federal Government Affairs, Jeff Vanderslice. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Matt, and welcome back to our next and final panel uh, uh, discussion for today titled The 2024 Election, What's Needed from Conservatives. Uh, we're joined here today and I am thrilled uh, to be able to introduce uh, to all of you um, our distinguished panelists for this discussion, each of whom, as you'll hear, um, have engaged in various efforts, uh, both inside and outside of government, to help uh, promote public trust in elections. Uh, ben Ginsberg is the Volcker Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution and co-chair of the Election Official Legal Defense Network. Uh, Amelia Gardner is Commission Chair uh, of the Utah County Commission and finally, Scott uh, Turner is the Executive Director of Eternal Vigilance Incorporated and a former uh, state representative from Georgia. So welcome to each of you and, and thank you for doing this today. Um, we'll turn to a discussion about uh, what each of you are doing in, the, in, in your various capacities uh, in just a moment. But, I, but, but, but before we get there, I'd like to give you each an opportunity in your own words to sort of um, establish uh, what you see as the current state of uh, public trust in our elections. Um, and, and, and if, Ben, you want to go first. Sure. Happy to. Thank you for, uh, for having me and for this discussion over the past couple of days. It's been immensely helpful. As you've heard, as you saw in the Gallup polling uh, information, the state of public confidence in elections is, um, to be gentle about it, kind of tenuous. 30% of a population not having faith in the credibility of results is probably not long-term sustainable for a democracy uh, and for the current system of government. So it's, it's absolutely essential to reestablish that trust and confidence. I do think that there are a few things that can, that can be done. The panel you just had with the election officials and talking about actions that they take to talk to voters who doubt, the transparency that they use is, um, is absolutely crucial in that. I also think there needs to be real introspection among those who are worried about the state of the democracy, um, simply because the number of doubters in the results of an election was 30% uh, in January of 2021. And you know what, it's still 30%. So over the last three years, the efforts of many media outlets, the efforts of many nonprofits have not succeeded in denting that number. And that's a real problem. So a couple of things that, that really can, can be done to this. The first is there's been a reluctance to engage with election doubters, not so much on the local level by election officials, but more systemically by the conservative movement and by others involved in the area. And so the, the Gallup information and uh, what was said on the panel about figuring out the message, the messengers, the media channels, uh, the social channels to reach uh, election doubters is really, really crucial to do. Um, and secondly, I think it's imperative, and we'll talk about this more, to attack this on a local level instead of a national level. That the national level is so poisonous, which we know as Washingtonians, but I think which everyone else feels, that local solutions really pinned to the local election officials is great help, and the nonprofits and conservative groups is, uh, is the way to tackle it. That's great. Amelia, do you want to add? 
Anything? Yeah, um, I was faced with this problem a few years before everybody else. I ran for office originally as county clerk in 2018, and during the cycle that I was running for office, our governor called the election office of Utah County the epicenter of dysfunction. That was a great quote for my campaign, but not so much for the morale of the office. And so coming into office in January of 2019 as a local election official, I was faced with this, uh, this office that nobody in the public had confidence in. Even if they had general confidence in, in Utah in general, they did not have confidence in, in our county. We're the largest Republican-controlled county in the state, in a state that has a supermajority Republican. And so it was really a, a key stronghold for the state. And I came in knowing that I had 18 months to get ready for a presidential election. I had no clue it was going to be such a divisive presidential election and one that that was going to be critical, but I knew that I had to increase my voters' confidence. And we did it by starting at the ground up. My background is in manufacturing. I worked for Caterpillar, construction and mining company, for 12 years. And so I came in and approached this uh, like I would a manufacturing facility, process-oriented, checklists, and then I brought this attitude of radical transparency. We created a new election uh, center where we did all the ballot processing, and as we came in to do some construction, I had the public works folks literally cutting holes in walls and putting in windows. So during the 2020 election, as people were putting paper over and covering windows, we were literally cutting holes in walls and adding windows. Uh, 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, we had four news crews on election night in our ballot center watching us process ballots because I was the only ballot center that would let the news in because of the pandemic. But I said, look, we don't have the luxury of, of being cautious. We have to be hyper-transparent because we were the epicenter of dysfunction. And I, I, I want to hear more uh, about that in just a moment. Uh, 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 Scott, if, if, if there's anything that you uh, would like to share about sort of your assessment of the, of the current state. Yeah, I, I think what is happening within Republican activism versus the average Republican. And what I mean by that is the activist class, the people who show up for breakfast it's on Saturday mornings, or they might be a delegate to the state convention. Like there's a, a, a demonstrable disconnect between their rhetoric and their behavior and their beliefs and it with the average Republican who would pull a ballot specifically in Georgia. And we were able to, uh, through our work at Peach Pundit, which is a political blog in, in Georgia, we were able to do some really kind of fun analysis because they ran a poll post state convention ahead of the, the primary when David Perdue was challenging Brian Kemp in Georgia. And um, uh, I'll point to highlight that race and maybe one or two others. But in that particular poll, the people who went to convention were going to vote for David Perdue for governor at a 50, 50, over 50%. Brian Kemp was at 31. Fast forward to election day, primary election day, Brian Kemp beat David Perdue by over 50 points, 73 to 21. Uh, so it, that race, our AG race, uh, had uh, Chris Carr losing to a guy named John Gordon, who was a Trump-endorsed election denier. John Gordon got 71% of the vote in the poll of people who go to convention, and Chris Carr, our sitting AG, got 29%, and then in the election, that flipped. Chris Carr got 73%, and John Gordon got 26%. Uh, Jody Heiss was winning with 68% uh, over Brad Raffensperger in that poll, and Brad, Brad Raffensperger clearly won nomination without a runoff in a four-way race. So there was, yes, he gave, gave his in the audience. Uh, so what I see heading into next year is you have a very committed and very loud group of people that are in the extreme minority that are also Republican that are given an outsized influence amongst our elected, elected officials and leaders. And they are driving public policy in a way that's very uncomfortable for us who realize that they are not in touch with the soccer mom or the suburban dad who decides to, that he's going to pull a Republican ballot on primary day and vote Republican in a general election as well. And so that is, a, that is a, an issue that I think we need to continue to work on. 
in your assessment, how do you think we've gotten to this point? Because I, well, we're going to get to solutions in just a moment, but, but uh, to the extent you, you, you feel comfortable talking about this, uh, what, what has gone wrong, uh, in other words, and, and why are we at this point today? I think one of the things that has gone wrong, there's a, there's a connect between the ease of doing something and your perception of, of, comp, of competence. So if someone has a really good experience, a smooth experience at the DMV, they think their state government is competent. Voting is no different. Your average person comes in and they, if, e if voting is easy and accessible for them, then they have higher confidence in the results. But this hyper-partisan group that you're talking about what's wrong with them is that their person didn't win, right? And, and I think we've seen this historically a little bit on both sides. If a Republican wins, then the Democrats think it didn't happen, and if the Democrats win, then the Republicans think it didn't happen. But I think what we're seeing differently now is uh, the contingency that is embracing that and becoming almost vitriolic with it is being empowered. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember Mr. Ginsburg's excellent work in 2000, but post that, I'm also remember Dick Gephardt saying George W. Bush was not a legitimate president. And it seemed like that was the first time in my lifetime that I really recognized, I think it was 25 years old at the time that happened. But in the, in the preceding years that have followed that, it has become all too common for somebody who doesn't like the result of the election to question the, re the results of that election either by claiming fraud or voter suppression. You know, I wrote a piece where I, I talked about how Stacey Abrams and Hillary Clinton paved a road that Donald Trump drove a Mack truck down. This was, it was, we were not in new territory. And so you see the legislature in Georgia do things like SB 202 and then get maligned in the press. And then we have post-election polling that shows that not a single African American, not one respondent to that poll, it was done by UGA, so not exactly a bastion of conservatism. But in that poll, they could not find a single African American that said that they felt like that it was harder for them to vote than it was the, from before SB 202 was signed into law. And yet, the media, media narrative slays Republicans over that. It's voter suppression. And even like this past week, Stacey Abrams is on, is, is on MSNBC say, maligning our Secretary of State and Governor, saying they are still suppressing the vote. And there's zero evidence to that. And, and so it happens on both sides, and it's been happening for a very long time. So I, if you ask me what I think went wrong, I think you can find a lot of, of the root of the problem started in 2000 with that election. <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I, I think that elections and faith in elections is part of a general crisis of confidence in American institutions today. So elections are not immune from what's happened to, to many American institutions. I think what's different about elections is that it has always historically, really out of historical necessity, been an institution in which everyone had faith that you would accept the election results. And so 2016, I would say, I mean, I think that's a fair point about partisanship and where it started. Things got turbocharged in 2016. <coughs> We never had a major candidate for the presidency say before the election, the election's rigged. That got doubled down in, in 2020. That's going to take a toll. And I think that generally the pro-democracy movement has not shifted its strategy or tactics to take into account how, how poisonous that, that, that can be. And that's part of what I was talking about what I meant when I said we're sort of talking past each other these days. Uh, and you need to figure out the channels of communication, who the trusted messengers are, what the message should be to bolster faith in the institution of elections again. Uh, that's helpful, and I think that's a, a nice segue into my final question for this sort of section before we talk more specifically about your work. You've sort of answered this uh, question, Ben, but. Um, what, in everyone else's view, and, and if you have anything to add, of course, um, needs to be in, in improved uh, or, or changed to improve public trust, right? Is this, is this simply a communication uh, issue? Is it a public education issue? Do we need better public policy? Do we need better 
uh, and more disciplined candidates, particularly uh, those who end up losing elections, right? So, so what, is, what is the thing uh, that, that needs to happen? Maybe it's all three or, or something else entirely. Well, I, I think the days of making an election law, setting it and forgetting it are over. I think from now on, the concept of voter confidence is a moving target for the rest of our lives. There's always going to be a new threat on the horizon that we're, as, as policymakers we're going, and, and advocates, we're going to have to try to get ahead of. It's, it's no longer okay for, to let the crisis happen and then react. We're going to have to, con in this, this concept of continuous improvement that we've talked about over and over again in each of the sessions that we've had with the SNF Agora gathering, that, that needs to be adopted by every election official and every legislator and policymaker and advocate in the country and recognize because the, there's a, the, the SB202 narrative in Georgia was that we were only doing this because Donald Trump questioned the results of the election in Georgia. But again, going back to 2000 and to Hillary Clinton convincing half of the Democratic Party that Russians hacked the election and stole it on behalf of Donald Trump in 2016, like, this is a bipartisan problem that we're going to have to give each other grace and try to figure out how, to, how do we get ahead of the problems the, 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 the analogy of whack-a-mole has been used. I like to say stomping out fires before they become you know, wildfires. Uh, that is going to have to be how we react moving forward. I don't see any way that we can get around that. He makes a great point. If you look at the history of election administration, there really weren't great strides made unless there was a crisis that triggered that stride. Um, going all the way back to before I was born in the 1970s, you voted at your polling location and they counted it there. Well then in the 70s they came out with the punch cards and then hanging chads, because all of us now know what chads are, hanging chads brought in the electronic voting machine and that brought in the Diebold machines. And those machines stayed until we had the next crisis. We typically have about every 20 years, a generation will get one major change in elections up to this point, and that change was fueled by a crisis. Um, election administrators had really in the past embraced this attitude of, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? And that's really how a lot of the election world was. Um, this idea of looking at it as, con as continuous improvement really resonates with me coming from the manufacturing world with lean manufacturing and Six Sigma. We did this at Caterpillar all the time. Um, that's gonna be a, a big part of that, is embracing this, that we, we can't sit on our laurels, but part of that is funding. So I had three things that I think we, we need to look for. One of them is funding. My predecessor, one of his claims to fame was that he hadn't changed the budget for his elections division in his whole term in office, 12 years. Our population had doubled and his budget hadn't changed. That also means that he didn't have any new equipment, that he hadn't improved his processes, that he wasn't keeping up with wage, wage growth and inflation, so he had underskilled workers. I mean, we need to be willing to fund elections. Elections being a core function of government are funded out of the general fund at a government and that general fund has to compete with criminal justice and first responders. It's the same fund and we need to realize that elections matter and we need to fund them. Uh, I think uh, the second thing that we can do is radical transparency. If you can see every step of the process, then, then it's hard to say it was stolen. Um, and the third part of it, and I think this is one, one thing that every one of us sitting in this room can do, we might not all be able to change the general fund, uh, but one thing we can do is we need to stop rewarding the folks that get attention when they claim the election was stolen and we need to question them. So it's twofold, stop rewarding them, but then also question them. When someone says the election was stolen, say, show me the proof. When someone says, well, they don't, you might be okay, but they're not okay over there. Okay, well then what are they doing that, that you think is not safe? Uh, we need to be willing to question and to stop rewarding the bad behavior. Anything to add? Yeah, yeah I just want to emphasize the, the notion of transparency that you mentioned and how uh, really important that is. I think that for many, many election cycles, people didn't care enough about the mechanics of uh, elections to ask for transparency. 
uh, and transparency seems to be part of the key I hear from all the election officials I talk to in terms of, of busting the myth. What's important to remember is that people who come to rooms like this and even to election administration meetings are self-selecting and that there are 10,000 or so jurisdictions, nobody quite knows the number, which is a comment in and of itself, and to really be able to, to deal with the system as a whole, got to figure out ways to, to reach all 10,000. In 1967, uh, Ronald Reagan made the following remarks in his inaugural address as the new governor of, of California, and in that he said, Today, we are participating in the orderly transfer of administrative authority by direction of the people. And this is the simple magic of the commonplace routine which makes it a near miracle to many of the world's inhabitants. This continuing fact that the people, by democratic process, can delegate power and yet retain the custody of it. Perhaps you and I have lived too long with this miracle to be properly appreciative. Freedom is a fragile thing, and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation, for it comes only once to a people. And those in world history who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again. And this, this quote really moved me because I think you know, it's, it's, it's not lost on me that this is our generation's time to um, uh, not only properly appreciate, but also defend this miracle in, in Ronald Reagan's words, right? By promoting specifically trust in our elections, which each of you are doing in your own various ways. Um, so I'd like to explore that a little bit further. Um, uh, Amelia, you, you started to uh, talk about that um, just a little bit. So I, I think there's there's uh, more uh, that, that we'd love to hear. But um, Ben, if, if, if you want to start first uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, unpack that a little bit. We'd love to hear about it. Sure. I, I completely agree with the trust factor. And I do think that sort of looking at the, the field of elections and the whole democracy sort of issues that the Ronald Reagan quote beautifully highlighted, um, it really is important to go local with this. And what we can actually do on a scalable model is really assist local and state election officials in doing their jobs. Um, I think that I'm, I'm co-chair of a couple of organizations that, that try and do that. One is called the Election Official Legal Defense Network, uh, in which we provide pro bono legal counsel to election officials who come under the uh, litigation gun and need help beyond what their, their county and state uh, attorneys can do for them. And that's sort of turning local and trying to help out. Um, I co-chair that group with Bob Bauer, who's a Democratic lawyer with whom I was a fierce adversary for 40 or so years. But we did have kind of common ground in, in helping the election. A second project is one that tries to deal the Election Official Legal Defense Network deals with the system, a, a, right. a symptom but not the cure. And so uh, we have a program called the Pillars of the Community that will go into the most contentious election jurisdictions in the country, try and get leaders of the community, non-political in nature to what Mindy Finn was saying, political officials, former office holders, not so high on the trust scale these days, uh, first responders, the people who own hardware stores, people of faith, uh, civic organization heads, and get them around a table with their local election official. Have them really kick the tires on the election system. We certainly want people who are doubters about elections, their trust in elections, uh, to be able to really learn about their local election uh, systems understand that peace and prosperity in their communities is really important to them. And then if there is a problem in that jurisdiction to validate the accuracy and strength of, 
of the election system. Not who won the election, but just that the mechanism in place to be able to tabulate that and to determine that is there and trustworthy. Part and parcel of that is a project uh, with the Election Trust Initiative and the Hoover Institution to talk about the steps of the election process and to really lay out, hopefully in a pithy document, uh, all the safeguards in the election system in all the stages from when somebody registers to vote to how the rolls are maintained all the way through uh, counting and certification of the process in hopes that that uh, material will be available to election officials to be able to deal with the problem of whack-a-mole uh, which is sort of constant among the, uh, the election denier activities. And, and when will that go live, or is it already Well, it'll live? be live. This is all sort of paced to... 2024? Yeah. Got it. Yes, yes. Great. There's a 2024 project. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I've now shifted, and I'm, I'm not running the election on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm no longer the clerk. I'm now a commissioner, so I'm a member of the Board of Canvassers. Um, but I do have uh, the, the ability, and I have the unique situation where I'm not in the trenches doing the work, um, which means that I actually have some bandwidth to spend time explaining to people how the work gets done. Um, oftentimes you get so busy doing the work that you don't have time to do maybe that PR. And that's really one of the areas that I've been focusing on. Um, I've been working with other jurisdictions. Like I said, I was lucky that I was a couple of years ahead of the curve and I had to regain the trust of my community in our elections prior to 2020, which means that as I, as I talk to election officials, I can show them how we did that. So I've really created this blueprint. I've been to Georgia, um, I've, I've been to some Florida and, and Texas, and I've had calls with Maryland and folks in Nevada and California. And when I call them, I talk to them step by step some of the simple things that they can do to try to bring that transparency and help regain that trust. So being a, a resource for them. At the same time, we have a lot of legislators out there right now that want to pass legislation that will help people regain trust. And some of that legislation just is really not feasible. It's logistically, it's not going to work. It's really expensive. And so I spend a lot of time with legislators who have good ideas and really good intent. And then I sit down with them oftentimes and they say, well, my county clerks don't support my bill. And I can sit down with them and say, what are you trying to accomplish? Don't, before I even look at the words on your bill, what are you trying to accomplish? And then I can read the bill and say, okay, here's the problem. What you're going to do is going to cause these logistical issues for your election administrators. We can accomplish your goal doing it this way or finding another way. And I'm finding that having somebody who has been an election administrator who also now sets the budget for the election office, I have a very unique perspective where I can sit with legislators and say, let's find a solution that's going to work that can get funded and that works. So really taking my years of experience and working forward, the other thing that I try to do um, being more partisan now, obviously as an election official, I was, an, I was a partisan elected official, but I wasn't really political. I'm in more of a political position now, and I try to spend a lot of time pushing back on the folks that are in my own party that claim that the election was stolen. I spend a lot of time pushing back on them. I make some friends and a lot of enemies. Um, <laughs> But I do that by humanizing the election. One of the things I do is I tell the stories. When people say, well, those people at the election office, I put names to it. I say, you're talking about my friends. You're talking about Sherry, who's the mother of nine children. You're talking about Carly, who's worked in that office since the day she graduated from high school. You're talking about Nikki, who lost a baby on election day and still showed up at work to help us canvas 14 days later. So when you're telling these stories, you're talking about people that you go to the grocery store with, that your children go to school with, and people that live in your neighborhoods, and it's not okay. Uh, that, that's... Yes. And, and uh, for, for both things that you've uh, talked about that you've done, how has that been received? Uh, not only sort of your private outreach to um, uh, folks across your state and across uh, the country, 
um, but also specifically the, the sort of pushback that you've talked about? You know, I've really been uh, surprised and happy pleasantly um, and encouraged by how much legislators and election officials have been willing to come in and sit down. And I feel like I'm a bit of a translator. I, this is what I did in my career at Caterpillar. I took engineer and translated it into customer, and then I took customer and translated it into engineer. And I feel like I'm kind of doing the same. I take legislator and I try to convert it into election administrator, and then I take it administrator and I, and I translate it into legislator. And I've actually had a, a lot of legislators that have been very, um, very happy, very willing to change and modify and look for solutions. That part's been very encouraging for me. Um, and I've been happy to, you know, to travel to these states and work with them and see the progress. That's very rewarding. Now, with that said, I've also received death threats. I've received violence threats. Um, I was on the ballot last year for re-election as a commissioner. And there was a crowd of people that would follow me from campaign event to campaign event. Um, I had to block people on social media and then explain to the ACLU that I was blocking these people because they took a picture of my autistic son and was spreading it around. So I've felt that, um, that side of it. But the most, for the most part, there's reason to be happy and encouraged. Uh, people really are responding well. I want to endorse Amelia because I brought her to Georgia to talk to legislators and the criticisms of some of the reforms that we've offered kind of fall into two categories. One is like completely and demonstrably false and that's like the largest category of criticisms. And the second is like technically true but there's a good explanation or there's a way around it or work around. And when we brought her, it's like the value of having Amelia who is a rock star conservative talk to Republicans in Georgia about things that they've been told for the last two years are completely true. And she's like, no, no, that's not how it works. Let me tell you how it actually works. I, I completely endorse Amelia coming to every state. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And, and Scott, we'd love to hear more about what uh, you're doing in Georgia. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have a roundtable discussion. It's made up of, of national resource, national partners, locals, uh, grassroots, um, and we have sort of a three-tiered where we're trying to build relationships into a business community at the legislative level and also in the grassroots activist community. And so different groups have different focuses uh, within our roundtable that we meet every couple of weeks and uh, wh where their, their strengths are in that. And we sort of lead the legislative effort since I'm of the legislature and have those relationships. But one of the things I found that was really effective, one of our partners, it's an informal coalition. It's not, when nobody signs an oath or anything, nobody has to drop, give a drop of blood and swear <laughs> that they'll keep secrets or whatever. But one of the, one of the folks who recently joined our coalition is the Carter Center. Um, Carter, you know, Jimmy Carter uh, from Georgia is a legend and uh, they do really good like pro-democracy work internationally. But in the case of Georgia, one of the things they did um, highlighting the need for the consent of a loser, which is something that our friend Matt Germer at R Street has written extensively about. They created a pledge and they actually got Stacey Abrams to sign the pledge saying that she would concede. Uh, and that story is movie worthy, at least a scene in a movie, of how they got her to do that. But she did concede, um, even though now she's still claiming suppression months later. In, in the moment, it, there wasn't outrage from the initial election results, and I think that was a, a key part of creating that new norm, or reestablishing a norm that should never have gone away. That's great, thank you for that. I think we have time for some questions, is that right? Um, so about 10 minutes uh, before I'll take moderator's prerogative and ask the final, final question. Uh, but any questions from the audience? While we wait for a question from the audience, one of the things that I instituted at our county that they continue to do that I found is really helpful that may help others, at the end of every election, we sit down with the election team and we would do a debrief and we would ask them um, what went well, what didn't go so well, and what ideas do you have to make it better next time? And we do that at the end of every election cycle with the entire staff. And that has really helped us um, continue this idea of continuous improvement. I know that's been a theme today. Um, it wasn't necessarily on our topic on the panel today, but I wanted to, to put that out there. Just that one simple thing uh, can be very helpful for election administrators. Just ask your staff those three questions. What went well? 
what didn't go well, and what can we do better next time. And if we do that every single election, then to your point, we this won't be something that happens every 20 years. It'll be something that sticks with us through the next generation. That's great advice. Questions? I think I see one back there. Another question for Emilio. First off, thanks for your stellar uh, uh, moral leadership and courage of the sort that Secretary Raffensperger was talking about yesterday. You really exemplified that in that Thank example. You, you are uh, in this somewhat unique position that you were an election administrator and now are in the political uh, branch one level up that is kind of overseeing the budget and, mm -hmm. uh, and really the administration of elections. What are the kinds of things that people in that role, especially those who may not have had that prior experience, if you were to kind of give uh, guidelines for what they should be thinking about, the, the political uh, overseers, if you will, of elections who may not be direct administrators themselves, what would be the two or three things you would encourage them to be bearing in mind as they carry out that aspect of their responsibilities. Yeah, I think the number one thing that every one of them should do is they need to have an intimate understanding of how their jurisdiction processes elections. Uh, that's touring the ballot center, whether that's volunteering as a poll worker, all of the above, they need to have a better understanding of the mechanics of elections because People are showing up at our commission meetings, our public meetings, making public comment, making all sorts of wild claims. It's imperative that every person at this level understand how elections have been run, and they've taken that for granted for generations. They need to show up and they need to understand that. So that's first. Um, the second thing is I think they need to understand that preserving our way of life, preserving the American experiment, means that we have confidence in our elections, which means they need to fund those elections. Um, I'm good friends with Secretary of State of West Virginia, Mac Warner, and when he told me the average salary of an elections director for the state of West Virginia, uh, it was, I mean, it was astounding to me. I said, how do you get anybody to, 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 to take those jobs? And his reply was, we can't. We can't get county commissioners that are willing to spend the money to fund the position because they don't want to have to vote for a tax increase. So instead, we've got someone fresh out of high school running our elections instead of a professional. That's not uncommon across the country. So you need to be willing to, to fund these, recognizing that you are preserving the American experiment and that's worth paying for. Um, and then I would say the third thing is they need to have the courage, if they know that their elections are secure in their area, when someone claims they're not, do not use our election administrators as political footballs, no matter how loud the cheer from the random people in your commission meeting is, defend them, because they're listening and they hear it. Any other questions? One more? A couple more. Yeah, this is, this is largely for Amelia uh, and Scott. Scott, I think you were talking earlier about how elections have turned into a political issue. Um, to do one further, it's kind of a defining political issue now such that it will disqualify you from being part of the club in such a way that a lot of issues traditional to what it is to be a conservative do not. How do you two navigate trying to talk to people about election trust in such a way that it doesn't disqualify you from being a credible messenger in your circles that, hey, I'm, I'm still a conservative here? I think one of the things that, um, that I get disappointed when I hear my elected official say, everything's fine. Uh, that to me is not a really an acceptable answer when somebody says, you know, here's, for example, here are some conservative principles. Oh, we don't need that. We're fine. Uh, that really disappoints me because I think it fuels the tinfoil hat brigade into additional rhetoric, different act, diff additional actions. And I think there needs to be a sense of humility approach to this uh, when talking with these folks. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the club, right? So like, I don't feel welcome in my own Republican Party in Cherokee County. Where I, where I have served on the executive board and I represented 50 or 60,000 people uh, in that county for the better part of a decade uh, because they are all about the stolen election claim. Uh, and so it has created its tension where, again, that disconnect I mentioned at the beginning, where you have the activist class who are out of touch with the average Republican voter in Georgia. Um, so you know that the majority are with you. 
right? But where do they go? And one of the things that's come out of SNF Agora, I don't, am I allowed to mention somebody's name who's not here that did something really cool, right? Well, he, he put it in a podcast, so you can go listen. There, one of the folks who, who attended, I don't want to violate Chatham House rules, that's all. It's a podcast. Yeah, so it was in a podcast. So uh, Curtis Chang uh, has a podcast. Uh, Curtis attended two of these, these gatherings, and at the end, he talked about the Republican Party or any institution that, that you have been part of for your whole life. Is it worth fighting for? Or not, and he had, and in the podcast he describes this concept of life rafts, and uh, this this is this was something that really appealed to me, because every time I've come to an SNF Agora gathering, I've tried to take something out of it that I can actually make actionable, take it back home and do something, right? And one of these things was after Curtis's podcast, he talks about you have three options with the Republican Party if you're a Republican, and this struck a chord with me. You can treat it like a ship, you can stand and fight. In which case, you're outnumbered, so good luck with that. You can hide and hope they don't find you and just kind of go along for the ride, but there's a moral hazard to that. Are you going to get wrapped up in, in all the craziness that they're supporting? And the third thing is, go find a life raft. And the life raft, you know, so we, we use Peach Pundit to, 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 outside of government, outside of our nonprofit work, to advocate for Republicans to, that have been Republicans forever, that walk into a, a party function and they don't recognize the vibe in the room, not just the people, but the vibe. What are they for? They're not for limited government. They're not for free market pr principles. They're for electing one person and only one person. But that's not really conservatism, that's something else. Conservatism and these people who have built their identity, you know, some of the polling data showed this, you know, people who have built their identity around their Republican activism, they feel homeless right now. So we've, we uh, took the Curtis Chang life raft model that we pulled out of SNF Agora and we started networking with groups around the state. And some of them have actually incorporated and have been calling themselves Republican coalitions. And it's to give the longtime Republican activists at every level, whether they're college Republicans, young Republicans, or just old party officials who don't feel at home in their, in their local activist community anymore, a place to go. And you see elected officials, you know, my own congressman has spoken to the group that popped up in my own county. I'm not affiliated with that leadership, but I was like, this is great. We we're plugging people in. So people are using Peach Pundit. They're emailing us and saying, where's my life raft? And if it's in Savannah, we send them to the young Republicans down there because we see them as a legitimate life raft. So that's something that we can do uh, and something we have been doing. And it's small and it's just starting, but the Republican Party is not monolithic by any means anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're all going to need each other if we're going to win any type of election in the future. So having the life raft in the event that these folks either uh, walk away, they get tired, and they they just throw their hands in the air and they get frustrated. Somebody, the life raft keeps you in close enough proximity that you can come back and maintain legitimacy of the organization because you have the experience in your activism over the, the career that you've been a Republican. So I think that's something that other folks in other states, inspired by Curtis Chang here, uh, should do. That's a great idea. Um, like Scott, I had served in my county's Republican Party Executive Committee. Um, I was a member of the executive a decade ago. And um, my kids thought that Election Day was a holiday because they never went to school on Election Day because we spent the entire day putting up campaign signs and doing honking waves and calling people for get out the vote. Um, and I've been a I was a conservative activist, a Republican activist for a decade before I became an elected official. And so I actually had somebody ask me this the other day. I was at an event. Um, I was actually at a Glenn Beck event and I had a guy from the Eagle Forum come up to me and say, hey, Amelia, there's a lot of stuff being said about you online. How do you, how do you respond to that? And I said to him, I said, I don't. And he said, why don't you respond to that? How do you handle that? And I said, look, I, I am a Christian and I tru truly believe what the Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. And I'm going to keep being me. I'm going to keep being conservative. I'm going to keep voting conservative. And I'm going to keep living conservative values. And if people want to throw me under the bus for the next 18 months, in two years, they're going to realize that I'm a conservative. And I actually walk into those rooms where I'm not liked. And I pretend that I don't know I'm not liked. And I make them convince me why I should be not liked. 
I mean, I, I, would go to the, I would go to my campaign events and that little crowd that followed me around, they were the first ones to pop their hand up for a question. I'd be like, let's just get it out of the way. All right, Christy, what's your question? <laughs> and I knew what her question was. Right, and I, and I would say, you know, for everybody in the room, I would say, I would say, this is Christy. She comes to all of my events, and she asks the same question. So I'm going to tell her the same answer that I've told her at the last seven events. <laughs> right, and I just, and I would, and um, like you say, it it doesn't change. And I just explained it. There's there's a group of people that have joined my party recently, and I know it's recently because I was an election official, and I've seen their voting records, and they didn't vote for the last decade except for the last <laughs> several years. And so, for example, they'd be like. I'm a conservative and I want to know why you're not anymore because I believe that the, you know, that the election was true. And my reply to them is like, look, a decade ago when you weren't even a registered voter, I was knocking doors, making phone calls and putting up signs for conservatives. I haven't changed. Ben, do you have something uh, that you'd like to add? Well, just that that's a wonderful prescription uh, for election officials to follow, and your yeah. courage in that is is really admirable, and it's a, it's a great way to handle it. Um, I do think that there are tangible things conservatives should do at this point over the next year. And let me just lay out five Please, as sort yeah. of a, a closing thing. Number one is go local. Help your local election officials. Number two is engage with, with uh, election deniers, much as you said, but that's something I think we all have to do uh, to, to be able to answer the myths that are out there about our elections. Um, number three is we heard a lot about public outreach about elections reliability, and we can't say enough that elections are reliable. I think that takes place on the local uh, level, and I think one of the things you can do as I've heard it from election officials, is have a group of supporters who are community leaders to echo the reliability of elections. Number four is, if nothing else, volunteer as poll watchers and poll workers and urge your friends and neighbors to do it. And the fifth is something we really haven't talked about, but we should. Election denialism is a bad policy for conservatives, and it is bad politics for Republicans. Look at last night's election results. Um, it was pretty much a rejection of the extreme MAGA agenda, and election denialism is certainly part and parcel of that. Mike Adams won his re-election as Secretary of State in Kentucky after a lot of a lot of courageous statements in that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, went a certain way, uh, and and all in all, we should make the case that election denialism is bad policy and bad politics. Four reasons for that. Number one is if we actually a Republican wins in the midst of election denial that Republican, that conservative, will not have the mandate of the people to be able to govern. And that's terribly important. Number two, the blazing realization should come that if you say elections are rigged or fraudulent or tainted on a presidential level, the same ballots elect people down ticket as well. And so anybody who actually says elections are tainted in their states and ran for election, their certification is also subject to the same challenges for fraud. That is a crazy theory to want to embrace. Number three is it dampens turnout that criticizing the reliability of elections is only going to hurt turnout. and. It's taking place without realization that the bases of the political party are changing. So many of the anti-fraud provisions that came into the Republican legislative uh, Furman and agenda packages were done at a time when low propensity voters were much more democratic. Part of the Trump phenomenon since 2016 is that there are many more low propensity voters who are now Trump supporters that existed. So trying to, to dampen turnout by putting up barriers to voting is actually now harmful to people who consider themselves part of the Republican base. And four is just kind of the 
observation on current events that as more and more lawyers to Donald Trump start saying their election law, their election claims were not true in 2000, that takes away the whole credibility of the argument about election denial. So I hope as conservatives or Republicans make either the substantive case or the political case why election denial does not work as a theory. That's a great note to end on, I think, uh, and we are out of time. So let's give our panel a round of applause. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you to the panel. Um, a huge thank to everyone today, to, to all of the panelists, um, to all of you, many of you who have been here for, uh, well, we started on, I, I don't know what day it is now, Monday night, uh, all day Tuesday, Wednesday. It's been a fruitful conversation. I know there's some new folks here, there's some folks on the live stream, um, but just really, really appreciate it. I think, I think we've seen today as, we've talked a little bit about it as a culmination, but it, as Matt will say, it's, it's just, we see the, the start uh, to work that needs to continue in, in 24, and I think the panelists here uh, have really talked about from leading with the research of where things are right now, um, to, to, to talking about some of the principles that we've put together um, to what needs to be done in, in 2024. And we've had some courageous election officials here uh, and election officers and, and need to figure out how to, how to continue that courage. Um, this was uh, a lot to put on and so just a few huge thank yous um, to, to all of, of you again, to, to our speakers today. Um, uh, at, at R Street to, to Addison and Bill who have done great work in, in terms of putting everything together. Um, folks that have worked with me, Young, Madison, Mark, Chris, um, people have, have, have really put in uh, a lot of work to, to our leadership, Eli and, and Hari and President Daniels. Um, we, we just are really grateful to, to have teams uh, that have allowed us to, to put this together. And then uh, last, it's been, it's been great working with, with Matt. It really is um, fun having a, a collaborative partnership with, with R Street and, and we're looking Looking forward to, to important work over the next year. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for, for being such an amazing partner on this. Uh as we head into 2024, we want to keep this conversation going. We want to keep the momentum going, uh, particularly at the state and local level, uh, where we have, you know, as part of our discussions today and over the past year, discussed how local election officials, community influencers, and leaders uh, can make a meaningful difference through the relationships that they build in their communities. Um, we want to keep the conversation going with all of you, our participants in these convenings. Uh, so please keep coming and attending. Please keep your ideas and your passion coming over the, you know, even just in the last day, many of you can reflect on the great ideas that we had about things that we can do into 2024. Uh, with that, we will now be adjourning our, uh, our event on building a conservative agenda for democracy. And uh, speaking of keeping the conversation going, we will be enjoying a reception on the first floor, and we encourage you all to come. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.